let's go ahead and get started, guys. It's 1110. We'll let people keep filtering in. But um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. I hope you guys can see me. I am Naomi, I'm the founder of Access Consulting & Co. Um, we are a boutique marketing and public relations agency um, that specializes in working with fashion, beauty, lifestyle brands, um, and small business owners. So uh, to get started, I wanted to give each of our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. So Jera, we will start with you if you could just um, start and then we'll go how it's um, set up on the screen. So kick it off. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Jera Perkins. Um, I'm a publicist and a journalist. I write um, full time for Afrotech. Um, that's my main uh, writing job. I also uh, freelance every now and then, but um, Afrotech is uh, my main uh, role. So uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm from Baltimore. I'm currently in Brooklyn. So that's my spiel. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for joining us this morning. Okay, so next, Jame, we're going to hop over to you. Cool. Hey, everyone. So my name is Jame Jackson. I am a senior beauty editor at In The Know, Yahoo, and AOL. I also am the founder and editor-in-chief of TheBlondeMisfit.com and also the Blonde Misfit podcast. And so my specialty is around multicultural beauty, fashion, entrepreneurship, and I'm so excited to talk to y'all today. We're really going to spill some tea, so I hope y'all ready because I'm ready, okay? <laughs> Yes, perfect. Thank you for joining us this morning. And last but not least, Deshonda, can you introduce yourself for us? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Deshonda Brown, located, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I am a 25-year-old full-time freelancing whatever. I do a bunch of stuff, but mainly I focus in culture, Black-owned businesses, mental health, entertainment, and pop culture across Hello Beautiful, Covator, Revolt, and I am also the senior features editor at Lady Gun Magazine. Nice. Thank you for joining us this morning as well. Um, our fourth panelist, Jamila, just to give you guys an update, she did have an emergency this um, morning, so she will not be joining us. However, if you did get the flyer, you will know that her um, social media information is on there, so feel free to connect with her that way. Okay, so let's just go ahead and jump right into these panel questions. I feel like that's what everyone's waiting on. They want to hear from you guys. They want to learn so much so much more. So starting with Jira and Deshonda, one. So building relationships with journalists hasn't and isn't too much of a priority for brands and entrepreneurs. Um, why do you think that is? I guess for me, I feel like it's uh, due to a lack of understanding of how media and the you know process of you know securing press actually works. Um, in my experience working with different founders of brands, they usually uh, have very minimal knowledge of what journalists and editors are specifically looking for in terms of their coverage and what they're most interested in covering at that point in time. So it's not just about a generic approach to covering a brand um, a initiative or anything like that. It's more about um, us as journalists who are invested in what we do, uh, going deeper than the surface level um, and finding story angles that like we really enjoy and also that aligns with the outlets that we're contributing to. Uh, so sometimes, you know, we're not able to envision what a story looks like from your point of view. So that pitch is really how you engage with us. And really, that's your that's your moment to shine and get our attention. So for us, we're looking for uh, pitches and uh, what we what we can cover. Um, we're really looking for either those potential story angles that you can offer to help us see what kind of story you're looking for or just crafting the pitch in a way that uh, shows us that you know what kind of story you want out of this. So we get tons of pitches like every day, like from anyone, all, all kinds of topics. So it's important to know like who you're talking to, what you're pitching and that it aligns with what they cover, so. Mm -hmm. No, very true. The pitch is definitely an important piece um, in terms of getting that publication or that press started. Um, Shonda, did you wanna jump in on this one to add any? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a lack of humanization on both ends. And I feel like especially right now when we're in a pandemic, people just, you know, we, we want to get the job done, especially because, you know, people have ends to meet, people have children to feed and rent to pay. And we totally get it. Everybody's on their hustle mode and on their grind. 
but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that genuine relationship needs to be there because you have to understand that everybody is going through their own stuff too. So definitely I agree with everything that was just said, but to piggyback off of that, to add on to it, you also have to understand that some people are going through their own emergencies. You have to understand that people are sometimes mentally overwhelmed. Sometimes it's just good, honestly, and I love when people do this, when people just check on me, like when they're not sending me a pitch or when they're not asking when something's going to roll out or, or if they're asking me if I got something in Dropbox, just really fostering that genuine relationship because at the end of the day, before this person is an editor or a writer or a full-time writer or a freelancer, this person is a person. So I feel like that gap in the relationship is really because people tend to forget that before we are our jobs, mm -hmm. we are people. So I think that that has a lot to do with the disconnect as well. Mm -hmm. No, I'm so happy you brought that up because I think that that is kind of what um, kind of energized this panel is wanting to make sure that people are taking the time to realize that you guys are humans too. And building a relationship is so, so important in terms of like one, you understanding and relating to the brand that you're about to speak about, but then two, giving you guys the grace in your profession to know that you're not robots behind the screen, just pumping out press that you need to kind of um, be offered the same type of space that others are. So perfect. Um, so next. For me, like I said, we work deep, deep, deep with a lot of fashion and beauty brands. So publications seemingly miss the mark when it comes to telling stories of Black designers. In your opinion, how can how can this be remedied? So I wanted to kind of, you know, get your perspective again to Shonda and then Jamee as far as what that looks like when telling Black designers stories. Um, when it comes to telling Black designer stories, because I'm not exactly in fashion, but I have written about Black-owned brands and Black fashion brands, I feel like, A, the mark is missed because there's not a lot of people that look like us at these tables and that are having these conversations and, and that are pushing the envelope because there are not people there to give us the opportunities. There aren't people that are reaching back out to us. And quite frankly, like some, some people don't care, unfortunately, but we, ha we have to use our voices and we have to use the power of our pen to really push forward those stories. For example, with Tear or with Telfar, those brands are huge. They're absolutely everything. But it's our, it's it's honestly our job as a community to not only lift up our own, but to encourage other people to lift them up as well. If we know that we're at these predominantly white publications like a Harper's Bazaar or a Vogue or a Covator or whatever, what have you, if we know that our brothers and sisters are doing dope things aside from the main brands that we see in the stores or on websites or are pushing ads, it takes nothing for us to just put a bug in somebody's ear and be like, hey, have you have you seen this brand? Or, yo, I really like this sweatshirt that I saw online. Let me, let me show you. Like, it takes nothing to even put the word out. Even if you're not in fashion, even if you're not in beauty, even if you're not in tech, it really takes nothing. It's free 99 to put your brothers and sisters on. And I feel like as, as journalists, as Black journalists, as Black female journalists specifically, it's really our job to keep pushing the culture forward and not be remiss that we have this superpower of people listening to us and reading our work. So we should use that platform for the greater good to really uplift our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. You, you like ride my mind. So <laughs> that's exactly how it is. Jaime, did you want to jump in as well? Yes. So I'm going to say this first as a Black woman, second as an editor and then third as a student because this is what I focused my master thesis on behind the black square, hire more black people. That is the only way that you can actually continue to amplify our voices because what I because as has been previously stated, we're not there. A lot of people see and it's sad because we really can count black media at a lot of these larger white publications, especially in fashion and especially in beauty. A couple of years ago, I wrote the story for Business of Fashion on why black beauty editors work twice as hard as their white counterparts. And the reason why is because we are expected to know mainstream. We're expected to cover you know the big brands and big fashion brands that get shown at new york fashion week but we also are the ones who our teammates are turning to because we're supposed to know the inner, inner workings of black culture or latinx culture or just bipoc culture in general 
it should not fall on us to have that invisible labor, but the only way to remedy that is to hire more people. Secondly, you have to hire more people at a higher level. Unfortunately, when you do look at a lot of these corporations, we are the freelancers, we are the junior writers, we are the junior producers on these things. We're not in positions of power to really be able to make executive decisions and more importantly, handle that money. And that's where exactly where we need to be. We need to be senior editors, we need to be directors, we need to be editors in chief. And so for these publications to be able to grow and to really amplify that, it takes a very um, conscious effort to first of all, look at your diversity and inclusion numbers, have that stark reality. And then from there, where do we go? Because a lot of people started having these conversations last year and then fell on deaf ears once it got off social media. And then once you hired a few black people in high, high profile roles, that's not where it ends. You have to continue to build that pipeline. And then as has been said as well, you have to be able to continue to reach back. What does your mentorship programs look like? What does your in-house talent pool look like? How are you amplifying these voices and ensuring that if you don't have someone on your team who can write to this particular idea, whether it's a Telfar or whether it's a Tia Adiola, like who can you hire and amplify? Nepotism in the black community can work just as well as it does in the white community. If these are your friends, these are the people you party with, your friend is a fashion designer, your friend is a stylist trying to get on, put those names out there and continue to build them. I love being in rooms now where I have the potential and the power to put other people on. At this point now, I feel like I have worked hard enough in my career where it's like, I'm going to be good, you know? And I'm not saying that in a cocky way, but I know what God has for me, he has for me. So now that I'm secure in mine, I'm also going to make sure that I bring others along with it. All it takes is one shot. And it's like this, other races and cultures are doing it. So we might as well do it as well. I don't even know if that was grammatically correct, but y'all know what I was trying to say. <laughs> no, we received it. That message is definitely like it, it, it needs to be propelled out a little bit more, but that is kind of the tone that we have to take in order to kind of uplift and to kind of put other um, black entrepreneurs and business owners in the space, especially within fashion that they're um, being respected and heard as well. Um, all of you have done wonders for my clients and just the smallest ways from you kind of either sharing something, um, accepting a pitch, and then like the floodgates open from stylists to other publications that normally would have passed up on our pitches. So the amount of power that you have and um, kind of uplifting is amazing. So like you said, reaching back, it does a world of difference for people in the smallest ways. So that literally leads right into the next question perfectly. Women of color essentially hold a megaphone now in fashion and tech. How are you guys seeing this shift in the voices um, and images of media and journalism? So I kind of want to hear your thoughts, Jara and Deshonda, kind of surrounding this. For sure. I think now, especially just because of the our current events, you know, the pandemic has like literally turned everything upside down. So everything is virtual, everything is online in terms of, you know, what we cover, me personally, just working for Afrotech, uh, it sort of amplified a lot of things that people weren't paying to before, paying uh, attention to before. So uh, for us, I think it's super important that we're uplifting these voices who see these dope things happening in our communities, amplifying what's going on for people who wouldn't otherwise know about these things. I think the great thing about um, us at Afrotech, we are a very uh, women, black women driven uh, team. So we we are the voices that are uplifting these brands, uplifting these entrepreneurs, uh, bringing these things into the to light and then introducing them to the mainstream so that other outlets are now paying attention. So I think that shift is uh, largely due to what's been happening over the last year and especially what happened over the summer because people are now just officially waking up to what we do and what's been going on. So I think that speaks to the impactful stories that we continue to try and tell um, now and you know just beyond. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I think that what is happening is that people are like, like it was just said, people are finally waking up. And it's sad for me to say finally waking up because it's it's been like this forever, right? And I think that what happens is now as journalists, we're kind of forced to shift our focus a bit more, but it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of twofold because the things that we're writing about now and the things that we're speaking about now, we've been wanting to talk about it, but now it just so happens that because all this, excuse my language, because all this bullshit is happening, 
now we're given the go ahead to write more diverse content or see more representative or be more inclusive or be more, you know, anything like that. But people have to realize that equity does not equal equality. Like we're doing the work, that's cool, but there's there's still more stuff to be done. Like mm -hmm. it, it can't be expressed enough that these platforms do need to be held accountable. Like even though I'm a freelancer, I know that a lot of you know, I know that a lot of publications across all boards, whether it's in lore or glamour or whatever, what have you, a lot of people on my level look like me, but a lot of people that we report to don't look like me. Mm -hmm. And even though we have these opportunities to get these pitches and tell these stories about amazing black designers or people in tech or people in beauty or people in social justice, because we receive those pitches, not everybody's gonna want to run them unfortunately, because some people might think it's too taboo, or some people might want to focus on a specific aspect of Black History Month, but not all of Black History Month. We can focus on Black hair and Black beauty and Black stuff, but we can't focus on public figures and we can't focus on the Black Lives Matter movement because that's that's too, you know, people don't want to, you know, ruin their, their feet or whatever by talking about this stuff. But in actuality, I feel like these, these megaphones that we have, there's not there's not too many people using them. Cause at the end of the day, the people that we write for are supposed to be our allies too. If you're paying me to write for you, if you're paying me to bring in this amazing black talent, whether it's an app designer or, uh, or a beauty founder or whatever, what have you, if you're paying me to write these black stories as a black woman, you as of you as a white person, you as an Asian person, you as a Hispanic person, whatever you are, non-Black person of color or non-Black person, period, you're supposed to be my ally. So there are more than enough megaphones in the world. And by megaphones, that can be a social media platform. That can be your pen. That can be you going outside. That can be you giving your dollar to a Black business. There are more than enough megaphones out there. There's more than enough way to support Black businesses and Black people, but it shouldn't just lay on the responsibility of black people. Allies are a thing. Mm -hmm. And you should be more than an ally, be an accomplice. Anybody can say I'm an ally to this, but if your actions don't follow, then you're not, what are you, what are you doing, son? Like that makes no sense. Be about your work. If you are, if you're just gonna keep assigning the black stories to the black writers and you're not going to give us ideas and you're not gonna allow us the freedom to do it, then you're not for nothing, but you're you're being fake. Like why are you pushing this diversity and representation bullshit if you're not practicing what you preach. It should be more than just me that you turn to for Black History Month pitches. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be the only person writing about Black History Month. Granted, I'm Black and I'm grateful. And a lot of Black people have done a lot of great stuff. But if you as a non-Black person of color or you as a white person are not comfortable with writing about Black History Month or just Black content in general, why don't you just bring more of us on the team? Mm -hmm. it, it's really a simple fix. I get it. Some of y'all don't have the budget, quote unquote. Some of y'all don't have the budget, but if you can crank out money for me to do this $200 story, you really you really can't spend another $350 on somebody doing a really dope photojournalism piece about, about photographers on the front line that are doing the work. Like, Come on, son, that makes no sense. Yep. No, I totally agree with what both of you guys said. I think accountability is really the word um, and kind of making sure that we're constantly reassessing these internal structures and revamping it to make sure that you guys are not just that kind of um, bottom, bottom level uh, part of the, the the publication that you guys are inside, your editors, you have a say in what's happening, you're kind of at the drawing board to make some of these changes in a consistent fashion. So it's like, we're not seeing too much accountability, nor are we seeing consistency, it like comes in these waves and it kind of peaks based on whatever societal events or things that are happening. And that's kind of where it's missing the mark and it turns into more of a performative action. And that's where we really wanna get away from. Okay. So I think I saw this question already in the chat, but um, leading into all of our small business owners and those that really want to get more into press, but don't know how, and they're kind of in the space where they need to DIY it because working with an agency or kind of retaining a publicist just isn't in the budget right now. 
Um, describe the perfect pitch or press release that would get you excited about a story. And this is for you, Deshonda and Jamae. I, I, I don't know. I feel like it really depends on A, what you're pitching and B, if we have a pre-existing relationship already. Uh -huh. Because some people will be sliding in the DMs asking to place their client. And I, I, really, I really don't mean to be this person, but I am very quick to just delete it if it, can, if it hits my DMs. Like, it's not like you're asking me if you can send me an email. Like, that's cool. If people ask me if they can send me an email, I'll give you my email. But don't send me a, a huge text of pitch and expect me to respond. That's a huge, that's a huge no-no. Like, don't, don't do that. My perfect pitch is something that is sent directly to my email. Something that is spelling my name correctly. Okay. Because you don't understand how many times I get emails saying to Chandra, Chandra, like Shonda with an S H A U at like the different variations of my name that just don't even freaking exist. <laughs> so that's one. If you get my name wrong, I'm just, I'm not going to. The only thing I will accept is if you forget the apostrophe in my name, because I go by either Sh Shonda or Deshonda. So that's okay. But don't completely botch it. I also think that if you don't have any type of visuals or any type of attachment or offering any type of like something to go with the pitch, then there's really no sense in you sending it to me because you can say all these great things about your client, whether they're a reality star, they build an app or they're a designer, but if you don't have any pictures or any social media links or any media kits, I don't know what you're talking about. So I, I can't say whether or not I'm interested. I also think that they should be clear and concise give me the who, what, when, where, why, and how. I'm not saying it has to be two sentences, but also don't make it two pages. If I have to do more than two of these to read the entire pitch, then just, just don't. Think about it from like you're reading a newspaper perspective. It takes like seven seconds to grab the average person's attention. If your lead-in sentence when sending us pitches is not getting straight to the point, then you, you've lost us. Because as it was said before, we get like 50 pitches a day on average. On a slow day, we get about 50 pitches a day. Hey girl, that's a real, real slow day. Yeah. That's a very slow day getting 50 pitches a day. So you have to find a way to make your client and you stand out. Because it's at the end of the day, pitching, because I used to be a publicist, pitching is, is ultimately selling. You get placements, your publicist keeps paying you. So if you're not selling your client in the way that they should be put up, then I'm not going to buy into your story. A nice succinct headline, something catchy and cute is always good for me. Something like something funny, something witty, something that makes you stand out because I, I don't care about stuff that I don't care about. Mm -hmm. And also please name specifically, if you know that the person that you're pitching to writes for more than one place, please name specifically the place that you are pitching to yes. because there are writers including all of us who are here that write for two three four five places at a time but if you say oh my client would be great for you to write about okay i'm sure they would but wh which one like do you want a hello beautiful do you want exo nicole do you want a revolt because i'm going to automatically think what this might go towards and if it doesn't work i'm going to tell you no so you gotta be specific about your pitch, be specific about your want. If you want it to be an IGTV live, if you want it to be included in a listicle, if you want it to be an interview, if you want a, somebody to write an op-ed on it, be specific about your ask. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think Jira said it before, you have to be really intentional with mm -hmm. what you're asking, because if you don't, then things are going to get lost and things are going to be confused. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. I hope everyone got that because she literally listed out probably the most important things that you would need to kind of get those pitches at least through the door to be seen. And I think that that is one thing I want to re-highlight is the personalization of it all. Again, going back to that human factor that we spoke about earlier, you can tell when someone is mass sending pitches out or when it's a copy and paste. And I feel like that kind of sends it a little bit um, downward, especially if you're doing it on your own. And as a publicist, if there's any publicists on here, that's just kind of a no-no in terms of you trying to really work your hardest um, for your clients. So 
Perfect. And then for you, Jame, what what is kind of your perfect pitch? I mean, Shonda really hit it on the head with like the personalization and the specificity. Um, I receive anywhere from three to 500 emails a day of pitches between in the know, between Yahoo and AOL, between people who want to be on my podcast, between people who want to get highlighted on the Blonde Misfit, not to mention people who still pitch me because they saw my byline on one random story on one outlet that I wrote for two years ago. And I still like to keep those in the vault because I never know when I'm going to want want to return to freelancing. Um, I am very honest when I say I give an email 10 seconds at most because I don't have any other time to, I don't have more time. So really that first 10 seconds is vital. Get to the point, introduce what you have to do, um, like what, what you have, be specific. And then also like the so what factor is the thing that I often find is missing in a pitch. Um, just to be very honest and frank, if I read it and your email or your pitch feels like 50 others in my inbox, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what makes this product or this brand or this person unique compared to everybody else? You have to sell yourself. Like Shonda said, it's a selling game. You have to be your best salesman. And I always think to myself, if I was in an elevator with Diddy, or if I was in an elevator with Beyonce or something like that, and I only had 30 seconds to, to pitch to them why I'm the dopest at what I do, what would I say? You have to think about it from that perspective and then put it in writing, figure out what is it that I can do that and sell that makes me different than everybody else who's hitting me up. Because at the end of the day, you are competing for a slot. Um, I saw it also in here in a question, the best day or time to email journalists, depending on the journalists and how you pitch, we do editorial calendars at the start of the week. So pitching me on a Monday is not going to get seen probably until closer to the end of the week, if not maybe even the end of the month. If it's something that has a longer lead time, you can specify that it's not timely, but usually towards the end of the week, Wednesday, Thursday, I don't really like Friday pitches that much because everybody is mentally checked out. Like those are great times. And then also be a fan of the follow-up. Don't harass us but be a fan of the follow-up, especially if there has been some form of engagement that has specified that we might be interested in the story. Because again, we're getting so many. The perfect pitch to me is um, informative, it's unique, it stands out from everybody else, but also like there's a human element to it. And I know like, especially with the transition of the pandemic and the quarantine, there are a lot of things that we don't have anymore that we used to have in place, like being able to go to PR brunches and, and breakfast and sit down with founders and all that stuff. So really, this is your shot. And this is the time for you to really show us what you're made of. And hopefully it resonates with us enough that we want to do the follow up. But don't leave anything out on the table. If you read your if you and especially for small businesses, being a small business owner myself, send your pitch to a friend. Or send your pitch to some a family member, someone who doesn't know a lot. Like let's say, for instance, you're trying to launch a, um, a product. Send it to somebody in your family who doesn't know 100% exactly what you do. And if they can answer all of the questions of the who, what, where, why, how is this unique, how is this different than anything else that's out on the market, then you're solid. If people are kind of confused and then they got to hit you up like, so sis, when you said this, did you mean that means you need to go to the drawing back to the drawing board because there's not enough clarity. So really clarity is important and to really anticipate the needs of your editor. Um, also, like Shonda said, please spell our names correctly. Yeah, there please. is enough. I know all of the women on this on this call. You can Google us. No flex. You can Google us. And our names come up on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, all the good stuff. We're constantly sharing our names, how to say our names, how to spell it. Just look it up um, because there's nothing worse than like, like has been said, like getting a mass email or worse, getting a pitch and like, it's not even your name. I'm like, what? So those be the worst. Like those, that's triggering. I'm like, okay, you know what? All right. Nope. <laughs> Perfect. No, I'm glad that you um, broke it down. I think that that's a really good like workshop that you can do within yourself and like just like with your family members, like you said, just sending it out and seeing what the response is and kind of are they able to answer all them questions on their own. And if not, that kind of probably uncovers a bigger brand development that you need to work on for your narrative and your brand voice that you don't have everything as clear as it could be to really make you as distinct as you think that you are. 
So I want to jump into the next question. You already kind of segmented into it, Jamea, because I really miss those dinners and taking out journalists and kind of learning a little bit more and kind of selling and having you guys come to events and kind of learning about my clients before I warm you up to any other pitches. But how has being quarantined shifted your approach to content and stories? Um, definitely specificity is key because whereas before I would go to events and I actually could interact with the product or I could actually touch the fabric or if a founder said something I could ask for a follow-up question we don't get that FaceTime that like that anymore and even so we're behind this right a Zoom or a Google Meet where yes we can still see each other and there's an interaction but there's that human element that kind of gets lost because of technology so it really now comes back onto the person pitching and creating this experience to do just that. You have to now figure out a way to create an experience for the people who are looking at whatever it is, but in a way that still feels just as good or feels just as, as authentic as if we were all in a room together. Um, I would definitely say that also the type of pitches that I'm looking for has changed. So for instance, in the makeup category, a lot of people, and this and statistics have proven it, people are not wearing makeup like they used to. I mean, really, we go into from the living room to the kitchen back to the living room, you know, like, so we're not really doing fit, beat faces and getting all these um, procedures done and all these things. So for instance, if you just launch a new makeup collection, that's great. But really, I'm thinking about, but is this going to sell? Remember, at the end of the day, all of us have different OKRs or measurements of success that are outlined to us by our directors or our editors of what a success for the story looks like. A lot of times we create the content regardless, but for me, a lot of my content is spearheaded by revenue goals, by traffic goals, and by diversity and inclusion metrics. And so if it doesn't hit one of those, one of those different things in a strong enough manner, I'm looking at it from an editor perspective, is this worth my time? And it's one of those things where I really am like, okay, so if that's the case, maybe I won't write up this makeup collection. Maybe I'll wait and later on down the road cover it. But right now, quarantine girls, we trying to get out here with the skincare. We out here trying to figure out one product that works six different ways. So those are the pitches that I'm going to prioritize. That is something also I think um, that is good for a pitch, really thinking to yourself the timeliness of it and if it makes sense for what's happening in the world right now, because that is going to determine how we respond. Okay, perfect. And Najera, did you, um, do you feel like you've had any like different approach to the content that you're writing about now that we've been in this pandemic? I feel like I'm a special case because I didn't start writing full time until like the pandemic really hit. So like mm. all of the last year I've been inside writing. So for me, I think since the start of pandemic, I feel like it's been a shift because um, in terms of Afrotech, we just kind of tailored the kind of stories we cover. So right at the start, a lot of people were uh, I guess, pitching very COVID heavy stories. And that's not something people really want to read like that. So I would try to avoid those pitches. Um, but now I really look for pitches that are unique. Give me something that I can be excited about. Uh, give me something that's uh, in line with things that I cover. If it's a one-off story, I understand the people that mention their story like, hey, this is related to my brand and my product, but does it go in line with the rest of the stuff that I cover? Like, is this something that isn't just timely to this moment. Is it something I can cover a month from now? Because a lot of times things get in the queue for my pitches. Like it's not something that'll go out the next day. Like it'll be something that'll come out a month from now. Is it still going to be relevant? Is it something people will be interested in? So for me, I look for things that I think are unique for my coverage and, think, and things that people will also find interesting when they click on our stories. So give me something, if it's in tech, give me something unique because I, I cover all things tech, but a lot of times in those pitches I get, it's missing the why. Why should I care right now in this moment? Why do our readers care about what product you're selling? Why your brand is doing this, that, and the third? You have to have a why in order to get a response from me or in order for me to pass it on to an editor. Because we don't have final say over some of these stories. Somebody else has to approve them. So give me something that's worth their time or worth me saying, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Can we cover this? How do you think we should approach this? I feel like this is a good fit. Give us something that we can work with. Otherwise, 
nine times out of 10, your pitch will get ignored. Cause I just, I don't have the time to respond. Hey, I'll pass on this. Oh, it's not a fit right now. I'll, I'll circle back later. We just don't have that kind of time in the day. So give me something that works for me. And then that is how uh, you get those relationships going with um, writers. All right, perfect. So it seems like you guys both mentioned one uniqueness, but then also timeliness and then figuring out a way to connect timeliness to something that has shelf life. So it has to be relevant now, but it also has to be relevant um, a little bit later as well. And I think that that's probably something that is directly connected to the metrics that you guys have to um, get to in terms of your traffic goals. So that's definitely a good point to highlight. So I think you guys kind of described a little bit of this earlier when you were going through your perfect pitch, but for all of you guys, um, how should small business owners, entrepreneurs begin to seek out journalists and what should they know about crafting meaning, meaningful correspondence with any type of media? What tips do you guys have for those that are new to seeking press? I have, I think I can share a story because I actually had um, a founder reach out a few weeks ago about how to go about interacting with media or, or how to get on my radar or how to, how do I cover your brand in a larger sense. So she actually reached out to me directly on social media. And from there we connected via phone and just had a brief chat. And I just gave her like a, a list of what things to include in the pitch, the who, what, where, when, and why, and then include imagery or include any important links, things that I can easily share with my editor. Because like I said, that's the person that approves your pitch. So I think in terms of people, brands, entrepreneurs that don't have access to PR, I think it doesn't always start with that direct pitch. Sometimes it's just the hi or like, hey, I'm reaching out or hey, do you have any time to just chat where I can give you the rundown of my brand? Because some things don't translate in an email. Some things are better heard. That's what will get people excited about it. So I think for people that don't have a publicist to be that middleman for them and uh, reach out to journalists and editors. I think um, a personable approach really works because that's a way that you can foster a relationship. It's, it's not just you getting one story out of this journalist, you can foster a relationship further than that. And it'll go beyond just pitching them stories. You know, they'll, they'll look out for your brand or they'll look out for things that you're doing, like get them excited and they'll, they'll come to you sometimes. It's not just about uh, you always just pitching, pitching, pitching. Yeah, I agree with Injera, like it's a relationship, right? Because all of us in media, we all play different roles, but we all, first of all, media is small. So you start knowing the same names at the same places that have different people who play different roles. When people move from one place to another, like we're all, we all are aware. And so it's really about approaching it as a network. And understanding that in order to be part of this network or this community, there's a little bit of give and there's a little bit of take. I personally love formulating real relationships with different publicists or people who work for different brands. Like these are people who eventually like we're DMing each other. Like we are sharing, we are like sharing love on social media. Like these are real relationships. And, you know, I think that it's, be, it's about really being intentional about like grooming that relationship in give and take it's like a it's like a real relationship right like you wouldn't just walk up to somebody and be like you my boyfriend you my girlfriend like you would groom like I would hope at least y'all would court them a little bit you know something and it's the same way with us um some ways to do that I think is to start following people on social media seeing what we interact with a lot of us We'll do call outs for different pitches or story ideas or ask people in our social network for recommendations of products or whatever else. So like you really kind of get to see a little bit of us on the back end and this kind of sourcing that we do. And then that kind of formulates how you approach us later on. Like Shonda said, some people, I know a lot of people who that whole DM pitch thing does not work. I also know some people who the DM pitches will work. And I know some people who are like, you know what, I can go for either, either or you really have to kind of figure out how do I cultivate this personal relationship with this person that feels authentic. It's not always going to be where you guys are buddy, buddy, keep keying it up at brunch, but there should be a level of respect on both sides because it's like this, they're doing you a service, but you also are doing us a service too, right? Cause we have stories that we got to write and we're trying to like put on for people. So looking at it more as like a symbiotic relationship, but you have to play your part. I really think is, is the most important thing to remember. Okay, perfect. And you, Deshaun? I think that if 
all, all of it has been said, but the, the number one thing that I want to want to point out is that respect factor, because at the end of the day, like we don't, we don't have the physical touch that we used to, right? Like the pandemic really did throw a monkey wrench into everything. So we have to really be respectful of not only each other's businesses and occupation, but we have to be respectful of each other's time. I am very huge on the separation between church and state. I love my social media for me, for my personal platform. I will definitely put, you know, my work up there because I mean, shit, I work hard and I want the world to see it. But for me personally, I feel like DMing me a pitch is kind of, it. A, I think it's lazy because my email is in my bio. So if you just, it's literally in my bio, like where it says email, mm -hmm. click it, there you go. It's one thing to ask for my email. I will definitely give it to you because that's how I receive pitches. But for me, it is disrespectful to just automatically assume that I am going to read your five paragraphs of pitch about your client when I literally just put up a story about my boyfriend and I taking shots. Like what, what, like that isn't, that doesn't compute to me. I think that there has to be a respect for each other's personal space and personal time. Just automatically assume that a person would prefer a professional pitch via email. That, that's just my advice. Just automatically assume that that's what you wanna do. Because if you see a recruiter from, your, from the job that you want, you're not gonna DM them and be like, hey, I, I sent you my resume. Hope you get a chance to read it. Cause then they're gonna be like, what? Like, why didn't you just, e like, just email it to me? Mm -hmm. I think that it's also a little bit difficult because in my space, I'm, I'm mainly entertainment. So I can't go to concerts. I can't go to meet and greets with the artists. I can't have that interaction with the artist and the manager and whatever, what have you. So now I actually have to sit and have my own listening parties and like, make sure I'm into the music, but you have to also do your research. It was said before, Google is going to be your best friend when pitching. Mass emails to me are just ludicrous because you don't know how that's gonna be received by anybody. It's, it's your job as someone who's pitching to make us A, care, and B, to make us feel special. So if it just comes out with a, hey, hope this message finds you well. Here's about my client. Here's the picture. Here's the boilerplate. And then you see that little mail chimp unsubscribe button and stuff like that. Like, but why? You have to do your research. You have to understand what you're pitching. You have to understand who you're pitching to. You have to look at what that person has recently written about. Because sometimes, like, like you said, it could be something that I wrote two years ago from a publication that probably doesn't even exist anymore. So I probably don't write about that thing anymore. So look at my, look at my link tree if I have it. Look at my contact and bio. Look at my Twitter. See the stuff that I've recently been putting out and see if it aligns with what you're trying to give me. It, it might. So, you know, shoot your shot. You only miss 100% of the shots you don't take but really try to dig deep and see if this person is a fit because I used to, I used to write about hip hop artists, but that was like two years ago. Mm -hmm. So somebody might send me an artist and I'll understand why, but if you look into what I am writing about now, which is mainly health, mental health, um, current news, politics, all that stuff, entertainment as it relates to pop culture and politics. If you see all the stuff that I'm writing about now, you will understand why the pitch that you sent me would have made sense for back then and not now. It's, it takes nothing to Google any of our names or anybody else's name to see where they're currently at, who they report to, what they do. And sometimes it honestly wouldn't hurt you to not just look up the writer, but look up the editor too. Because at the end of the day, if you pitch to the writer, the writer still got to go to the editor. So you can always cut out the middleman and go straight to the editor. I've had plenty of people get mad at me because I did not approve their pitch. Like, oh, you told me you were interested, but uh, I, I am, I, I was, but I don't have the final say in this chain of command. I can really fuck with what you do. I can really love it. I can support it on my own time. But at the end of the day, 
my editor has to approve it. And sometimes there's a managing editor above that. And sometimes there's a person above that and a person above that and everybody can love it, but maybe print and publishing doesn't work out. Or maybe an emergency happened at the White House or maybe a new app broke or maybe Rihanna dropped something new. Like there's so many things that can come into placement. So it's always best to always have that evergreen content too. Are we always going to care about it? Is it something that's happening right now? If it's breaking news or if it's evergreen, those are pretty much the best. But if it's something that can just fall where the chips may, like if your client came out with a book one year ago and you're trying to like recirculate it, like, I mean, two more months isn't going to really hurt you. Like, but if it's something that's happening right now, or if it's something that's always going to last like 12 skincare products that are best as you transition into the spring, or this new app helps connect people, or BIPOC people to, um, to BIPOC doctors. Like it, it, if you have that evergreen content, that's always going to last, it's always going to be useful, great. But if it's something that can wait, don't press me. Right. I, I want to add just one thing really quickly because um, Shonda brought up a good point about the respectability factor. One thing that I tell people when I do um, like consulting services, especially with small owned, black owned businesses, please write this down. If you are a culprit, always be professional because you don't know who will see what you put out there. I always, I always assume any email I send, any DM I send, anything, techn any text even that I send has the potential to be on the shade room. Like I go in with that mindset because you don't know, especially when you're pitching one of us, we might just simply forward it to the person above us who might forward it to the person above them. And you don't know at any point in that chain of command how something you said could rub someone wrong. You know, I have, I have even received emails from my editorial directors who, you know, someone pitched them and they just forward the whole chain because at that point you're not, you're not going through and deleting all the rest of the emails. You know, you're just, you just forwarding it. And then you can read the entire email chain and people shoot themselves in the foot every single day by not being professional, by being way too colloquial, way too casual, establish that relationship with that person. But I promise you this, even the publicists who love me, who know me, who send me birthday wishes, when they send an email, they know to come to correct because they know at the end of the day, this is business, this is personal. We can talk any other way. You can text me, sis, if this is how you wanna to talk to me here. But when it comes to work, Mm -mm. because at the end of the day, you don't know when I'm going to have to resurface that email to someone. And because like we all have said in some way or another, because the majority of the people above us don't look like us, don't set yourself up for failure by not coming with all your ducks in a row. And, and, and this is something that I don't think even in, applies to race. I would do this with anyone else. Don't come just any kind of way. Don't come incorrect. Use Grammarly, check, make sure that you are writing in coherent sentences. Make sure that it makes sense and be respectful because again, you just never know where anything is going to go. And I have seen horror stories of people who had great ideas and poor execution. And so I don't want it to be y'all. Yep. I think I can jump in one more time. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think that it's also, it's also extremely imperative to remember that because I have had plenty of people come into my email inbox and say, Hey girl, Hey girl, like what? All skin folk, hey, all skin folk and kin folk. Like we're, we're not cool like that. I literally just met you. Like always be your best professional self because like, like it was just said, you don't know who that's going to get forwarded to. You don't know. I may be cool with it, but if I forward it to my editor and be like, Hey, are you cool with this pitch? She might disapprove it just because of how casual and how cool you are mm -hmm. always. Oh yeah. Also, it doesn't matter how cool you are with, a publicist or or a journalist or an editor I, at least to me do not ever text me a pitch do not do that 
I've been texted pitches before. Not like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that an, in, that an email is coming your way. That I'm cool with. Like, okay, I'll keep my eye out for it. Mm-hmm. But don't text me a pitch. Don't, don't ever hit me with that. Especially because this, this, is, this is my personal cell phone. Mm-hmm. I don't want that on my phone. Because the minute I see paragraphs, I'm going to be like, oh, no, welcome to the block party. Like, you getting blocked for the day. I, I can't do that today. Mm-hmm. Always bring your best professional self because like like it was said before you have to understand that these relationships are everything like it 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 sucks that it's like that but that that's the truth like relationships will carry you so depending on how you carry yourself your brand your business your client whatever whatever what have you that's how your business is going to move you have to understand that these journalists like we're we're cool like we're people like we'll catch up with you like you can be the homie you can be the home dude but at the end of the day this is a business like you have to respect the fact that i'm not going to answer your call probably after like seven on my personal phone when you're asking me about when the piece is going to come out that you pitched me about yeah don't do that you can simply email me it's not like i won't see it and if i don't see it i mean you can always bump it to the top but don't call me don't text me asking about work related stuff especially after business hours always assume that close of business is 5 p.m eastern standard time mm-hmm. always assume that mm-hmm. don't call me don't text me you can email me and i'll see it but don't don't cross that that personal line because that's when we're going to start looking at you like you're nuts and you don't respect boundaries and that will that will be a surefire way to ruin the relationship very quickly Naomi I have one last thing I promise I ain't going to interject no more but I <laughs> but I thought about this because we haven't I don't think we've we've talked about this enough um the overall package matters yep. and especially depending on what it is that you're seeking you have to think my mama taught me this all the time. She was like, make sure when you on social media that the person that you want people to see you as is what you're putting out there. Because guess what? You can go to my Instagram and the content you see on my Instagram the con- is the content you're going to see on my Twitter, is the content you're going to see on Facebook. Some people are real, real cute on Twitter and Instagram and be ratchet on Facebook. And guess what? If that's you, Cool, baby. But guess what? Especially if you have a business account, separate your personal and your business. Because I have had um, people pitch me as talent who want to come in, and I love them. I love their. I love what they do. I love everything. And guess what? The people above me and the people above them and legal teams, they go on and they do their Google searches, and then they see those. Uh, tweets that you put out a couple of years ago or the fact that you don't have this or you don't have that be a student of your craft and really ensure that that brand image across the board just eats and breathes what it is that you want because again these companies especially bigger companies they don't want to be held liable if it comes out in the media oh you just put this person as a contributor but then they came out with these wild like they they were wilding and saying these crazy things the other day like you don't know and i think especially as business owners focusing on ensuring that you have great product imagery you know you can do that with an iphone Make sure that you, your social media are, is up to date. Make sure your website works. If you don't have a website, go on and get one, Squarespace, WordPress, whatever you need to do. Get something because I have seen it where we get pitches and then we go and y'all ain't got no website. And I'm like, so sis, how is it? They were like, we taking orders through the DMs. And I'm like, this is chaos. Like, you cannot, like, no. Make sure your social media is up. Make sure that it is reflective of you as a business owner or whatever it is that you're trying to send the signal as. And then really just put your best foot forward. Like there's no excuse nowadays as to why you don't have um, good quality images or why you don't have something that can at least stand. Like you don't need a DSLR camera. You can take these photos on your iPhone. You can record your podcast or your episodes with your phone or with a like a ten dollar twenty dollar mic from Best Buy, like there are no excuses. Um, and I just personally really believe that you should always just just do be your best, like be on, be on, because you never know when the opportunity is going to come and who is going to look at that opportunity for you. 
Okay, that's all I want to say because I really want to make sure. Everything you guys said was so true. I feel like there's there's so many layers to that question that I feel like it's kind of like building the relationship itself is kind of a journey. And then, you know, maintaining it involves a lot of kind of heavy lift. So one, like I wanted to point out that what we do when you guys mention like research is that quarterly we go through our master list and we update to make sure emails are correct and make sure you guys haven't switched publications or if you added another one and kind of continue to update on the industries. And then of course too, like you said, with those relationships, I can like numerous times people come and they're like, hey, do you know any brands that do this? Do you know any journalists that do this? What do you know about this person? And it's up to me to now say, this is what I know to either propel you a step forward or kind of say like, well, I mean, they're cool, but this one time. So it kind of then, you know, people take that information and they do what they want with it. So kind of continuing to maintain those relationships and staying professional at all times is really, really important. And then I love that you said social and kind of separating it. There's really a time and a place for everything. Even if I'm someone that still kind of blurs the lines between professional and personal on my social, if I post a picture of my son, do not DM me from that picture and ask me about marketing tips. Like it makes no sense. Just wait for a second, send me a separate DM or kind of just like read the room, honestly. I think that that extra step of just kind of being precise and what you're doing will make a world of difference in terms of maintaining relationships and actually getting that end goal. So I think all of that was super, super helpful. So I want to kind of jump questions because some of the stuff you guys already answered. So I do want to know who are your influences within your fields and how important was the representation for you in making the decision to enter this, this particular field of work? So I'll, I'll start with representation because I'm, I'm blanking on names <laughs> right now, but representation uh, in our field is super important uh, and it's partially why I took my career in journalism so seriously because like, as you can see, there's not a lot of us and there's definitely not a lot of us in senior level positions. So for me, I'm very intentional about what I write about. I'm very intentional about who I work for as well because it's also a reflection of me in real life. So uh, for me, representation is, is more than just uh, getting freelancers and getting contributors on teams and getting them into these opportunities for publications. Put these people on staff, give them actual jobs, give them ways to grow within uh, their roles, give them upward growth in these companies and these outlets because to make that change in media, to shift it to where we have uh, more amplification of our voices, you you have to get more of us in the room. So for me, representation is all about uh, making room for more people, uplifting other people, uh, aspiring writers, give them the opportunity to do what they do best. Okay. okay. I would say that um, representation for me as well was always important growing up. My mom had Essence, Ebony, Jet, Black Enterprise, O Magazine, right? And um, I think that seeing from a young age, just us depicted in so many ways that really kind of highlighted, and celebrated the Black experience was so important for me because as you get older, and especially when you start working in this industry, you realize that one, Black media outlets and Black journalists are not treated the same. And two, that there are so few of us that the few that are there, it really is important for us to build a sense of community, but also a sense of pride to bring it in. Every single day I walk in or I walk, you know, into these virtual rooms, I have to understand that I am not just me. I am also oftentimes a representation of our communities because I'm often the only one in the room. And it is something that I carry with me um, not necessarily as a demise, but honestly, as an exciting feeling that I can show people that Black people are not monolithic and that we can create this beautiful, diverse content and that we can exist in every industry. And honestly, when we are in any industry we're in, we're usually the best. I mean, argue with your mama, don't argue with me. Like we just do it. Um, for me, my influences honestly are like 
many of the women on this call like we were talking about this before we even before we started the panel like we a lot of us follow each other we see each other in our work we share each other you know each other's work i think especially when you're first starting out in your career you're looking at people above you and you're like oh my god like they're this and they're that and i love them so much and all that stuff and then you start realizing like these are just people like I, and I'm trying to take the Issa Rae approach. I'm trying to think more laterally, like who are the people next to me? You know, I'm looking at the people who publicists who gave me my first story on the Blonde Misfit years ago and I gave them their first byline. And now here we are five, six, seven years later, X, Y, and Z. And like, we're all doing different things. Like those are the people who influence me because oftentimes I think sometimes the, uh, the people who get the most shine you know 20 people behind them who really are putting in the real work and um and it's like that's not shade to anybody but it's just it just is what it is you know and I think that it's really important to look at the people next to you and to really be empowered like every time I look up Shauna got a new byline I'm like how does this like how is this writing more like and it's funny because people used to say the same thing about me they're like girl every time I look up I see a Jamee Jackson byline I'm like child I don't know how I was doing it but like that's what keeps me going you know to know that the that this generation our generation of content creators are really putting in the work and and doing something dope and like it the people around you should inspire you to go harder and if they don't then you need to change your circle um, and so that's really who I look to as far as influences and also the representation factor. Perfect. Perfect. I want to say for me, like it, it, it's a, it's a cultivation of things. My, like, it, it's kind of crazy. Like I've never said this out loud, but it's amazing to believe that the people that I put on such a high pedestal are now my peers. And it's such an amazing feeling to me. Like I used to worship Angela Rye and Soledad O'Brien. If you, if you were to ever tell me that I would have the opportunity to interview both of them twice for different outlets, I would have looked at you like you were absolutely nuts. But it is such a great feeling to know that the people that are even on these larger platforms like MSNBC, CNN, these major magazines, these major podcasts are people that are also willing to support you and uplift you and be there for you and give you these resources and mentor you. Like these, these people are now on the same field as me. And it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling to not only know that I've worked that hard to be up there with them, but to know that at the end of the day, they are working black women and women of color, just mm -hmm. like me. And we're, it's, it's no crabs in a barrel BS that the industry always tries to put on us that we're always trying to compete. It's none of that. Like it, it's honestly genuine love out here for all of us. Mm -hmm. I've, I look to a lot of people, like I said, Soledad O'Brien, Angela Rye, Jaina Jefferson, she is amazing at what she does. Gia Peppers always kills it. Scotty Beam always kills it. And these are just unapologetic Black women that use their platforms to push forward the real narrative of representation and diversity, which is actually lack thereof. I love to see people talk about things that aren't normally talked about. Like it's cool to talk about the new drop or the new this or the new that, but can we talk about how there's not enough of it? Can we talk about how there needs to be more essences and black enterprises and jets and ebony's? That's cool. And that was that's a huge part of our childhood. But where's more? It shouldn't just stop at the sophisticated black hairs, at the hype hairs. It should never just stop at that. Representation is huge to me. And that's that plays into every part of every single article that I write. I always tell all of my editors. I need you to know that I am going to write about the blackest shit that I'm that I possibly can. Because as a black woman, that that's my job. That's my passion. That's my bread and butter. I can only speak from the lens of a black woman. And I feel like as a black woman that has the superpower of writing and not only writing, but people listening to me and people taking heed and people sharing my content. I love to know that I cannot take that responsibility lightly. Representation needs to be talked about not only as though we have it, but because we don't. Let's talk about how there aren't enough beauty editors. Let's talk about how there aren't enough black tech writers. Let's talk about how there aren't enough black music editors or when, or when we do, we're pigeonholed into R&B and hip hop. Let's talk about that. 
I always like to talk about everything that's black, 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 black. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to talk to uh, Yvonne Orji, like I did the other day, amazing woman, I'm going to talk to her about the Golden Globe nominations and about how there were probably about a good, nice handful of black people. But where's the rest of us? I'm going to talk to everybody that I possibly can about black people in black ways. I'm not just going to skate around like, oh, how do you do your hair? Or congratulations on the, no. How do you feel about the fact that your that all of your colleagues were not nominated correctly? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the fact that when you used to get your hair done or when you used to get your weave done or when you used to get your makeup done, that they didn't have your shade or they didn't have your hair color or they couldn't sew in your tracks right? Let's talk about that. I'm not gonna talk about the cookie cutter stuff. I feel like with these publications, when you bring on black writers, black editors, black video producers, black directors, even in film, expect us to show up, show up and show out and respect the fact that our narrative is not monolithic. So we need to talk about all of it. Representation is not just throwing a black person or a Hispanic person or an Asian person in the room to write our stories. No, we need to talk about it all. We need to talk about tech. We need to talk about hair. We need to talk about beauty. We need to talk about social justice. We're more than just riots and protests. We're more than just Afros and braids. We're more than just Naomi Campbell. We're more than just the pinnacles that people decide to put out of us into the media. So when you hire us, Expect us to do our, our job, which is to write unapologetic Black content. And don't look at us nuts when we do it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nope. You said it all. <laughs> like, honestly. And I want to thank each and every one of you guys for kind of taking on the task to create that lane and that avenue for so many people to kind of come behind you. So many brands that need someone to amplify their voice, someone that's going to kind of push the envelope, like you said, Deshonda, and share information from a broader viewpoint than just kind of that area that they're trying to pigeonhole anyone into. And I feel like the work that you guys are doing should not be overlooked, but rather given a pedestal to speak more like this panel event. Like we really need to kind of understand what it means to work with Black journalism, what it means for Black media in general, and then even from our side with kind of understanding what it means to be a Black business owner and getting you into a space where you're comfortable to scale, to elevate, to kind of be these top tier brands. And I think that that's something, and why I love working with you all as well, um, that access really embodies. We started off wanting to slowly focus in on that entrepreneur that was not giving the shine, that was being overlooked. Um, it really started from me being behind the scenes at Fashion Week and seeing who, again, I think you mentioned it, Jamea, with who's actually doing the heavy work behind the scenes, but not getting the shine. And a lot of times it is people of color and kind of wanting to make sure that they're able to have their work and their kind of profession highlighted in a space where they can grow and other people can know that it is possible. So I really thank you guys all for joining on this panel, from giving your perspectives, for even taking the time out to kind of shed light and to give tips to others to kind of help um, them develop and kind of get their press needs. Um, so with that, I kind of want to jump over to the Q&A. Um, I believe we had some questions that were dropped in earlier. But for those that didn't have a chance to drop down, um, you can chat really quickly um, and add them in. So first, I hope I'm saying your name right, Kiera asks, when pitching, do you like for publicists to introduce themselves or do you prefer for them to get straight to the point um, as to why they're pitching? And I think someone touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, do either of you guys wanna take that question? I think it's important just to get straight to the point. I mean, if it's in your email signature, I can tell like if you're a publicist or if you're coming from a PR firm. So it's no need to do like the formal intro, just say like, get to the point of the pitch, say what you're trying to get across. Uh, I think it's it's implied that you're a publicist or you're, you're speaking on behalf of someone. So you don't have to specify. Okay, perfect. Anyone else, is that how you guys prefer it as well? Just straight to the point and kind of do introductions at another time or later on? I feel like you can introduce yourself, say, hi, I'm so-and-so from so-and-so. And it is helpful for me. I'm, I'm a huge fan of links. Hyperlink to your business or who you represent. That way I can know. Because say if I pass on the pitch that you're giving me, I know who else is in your wheelhouse. 
So I can say, hey, you know, I saw in your hyperlink that you also represent this brand or this person or this whatever. I'd love to circle back at a later time. So always make sure that even if you don't give the full spiel, like hyperlink to your business so that I can have an idea or a greater idea of who you represent and what it is you focus on. Yeah. I agree. Like a, like a quick formal, like introduction is cool. Like just, you don't have to give us the biography, you know, the lifetime version, like just keep it cute and simple. And then like, you know, segue into why we're here. Definitely. Okay. Perfect. Um, next question comes from, again, I hope I'm seeing your name, right? Ra, how often should you follow up and what is too much? (laughs) I was thinking of this one time, this guy followed up with me 26 times. Like, the only reason why I'm laughing is because I literally just let him just keep following up. I wanted to see how long he was going to keep following up. Um, and it was like clockwork. Um, I say that you, when you send a pitch, especially if it's not timely, giving it at least a week is good. And then the follow-up can just be a simple, like just nudge to confirm that the person has either received it and sometimes you can just ask them like you know if this is a fit or potentially a fit just let me know because I know that they want to get it back to the client like we have a potential here or if you're going to pass on a story just let me know there um if they still do not follow up I would say give it at, at, at most one more time and but at that point you really should ask yourself is there a reason why they're not responding does this fit is it in alignment are they on vacation? Which you can find out because you, if you look on their social media, you'll see I ain't taking no calls. Um, like just doing your due diligence there. I always say that there's a follow up and then there's the last follow up. Um, but I also have been in positions before where I really have wanted a story. And because my bandwidth was just stretched so thin, I was actually very dependent on that person doing it. So I think you just have to kind of like test the waters and really read the room and figuring out like what is like a good amount of follow-up, but too much is, it feels like harassment and it's annoying and we can see the email threads. And especially when you're like following up or like, don't, please don't put things in all caps. Please do not like all caps, like just following up. Like, no, stop. <laughs> um, but yeah, just read the room and, and be mindful of people, their deadlines. I know for a lot of us, the end of the month is always crazy because we're trying to file things or we're trying to get like our last little bit of juice in, you know, as we're pulling numbers. So probably following up with people three and four times towards the end of the month is really probably not the best time around the holidays. Same thing, just use common sense and and good judgment, I think, as far as like the follow-up. Okay, perfect. Um, Okay, next question is from Noah. He asks, has it been difficult to convince your editors to pick up Black stories? Yes. (laughs) Yes, God, yes. Oh my God, yes, yes. And the, the thing that gets me is because I write about, I, I write for so many different publications, probably like 10 at this point, it's it's more disheartening to me when I get turned down by my black editors. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it really does hit differently, I guess, because I expect to get rejected by a white person about a black story. I mean, I don't mean to be this person, but I mean, if we're gonna keep it a stack, we're gonna keep it a stack. I expect it, mm-hmm. but it, it hits differently when my black editors are just like, no, what do you, what do you mean? No, what do you mean? No. And when I'm passionate about something, I'm maybe it's because I'm a Sag, I don't know, but like when I'm passionate, I'm like wicked passionate. So I'll, if I really like a story, I'll fight to the death to get it placed. Like I'll talk to every single one of my editors and be like this story, by the grace of God, this story is going to get pitched. But sometimes it, you have to step back and I was told this once I don't like the phrase but I mean I guess I see what they're saying but sometimes you have to step back and kill your babies and understand that not everything that you that you love is going to be placed Mm -hmm. not every story that you believe in the editors might not and it it sucks because I've, I've gotten some really really amazing pitches and not just not just celebrities I talk to but 
people that are doing some really amazing work in the black community from black photographers. I, there was this one woman who created a beauty brand because she wanted to support um, her. It, it was, she had some type of disease and she was like, so the money that she was using, she was using it to, you know, support her hospital funds. Like there, there are some amazing stories out there and it sucks that sometimes either the news cycle won't permit for me to run the story or the editors just don't see it the way that you do but believe at anybody who's listening who has a who has a really like heartfelt story like there there really are some journalists that that really want to run with your story and it, it sucks because even if you are an editor even if you are a full-time writer we don't always get the okay and it it hurts different when you're really passionate about the story and you get that no, but there is no greater feeling than when you get that story after you've been fighting like hell to get it placed and you get that yes. So editors will turn down some amazing need to know black stories, but that doesn't mean that we don't care about them. Right, or that those stories don't deserve to be told. Cause one thing that I have also found is that up until I think the protests of last year, for me, at least, it wasn't difficult to convince my editors to pick up Black stories, at least for the publication that I write for now. But overarchingly in my career, it has been hard to prove to them why Black stories deserve to be told outside of February. Mm -hmm. Like, we are not, I, last time I checked, I'm Black 365, 24-7, you know, no, no, no days off. And the Black experience deserves to be told every single time and every single way in every single capacity. So a lot of times we have found that the black pitches get approved the end of January. We also find that a lot of the publicists will start pitching us their black clientele. And I'm like, so this was your client all year? That's that way. Right, and this is the first time I'm hearing of them? Like it's, it really has to be an ongoing conversation and a relationship. And I'm just hoping and praying that, um, even though we are seeing overall that the industry is to some degree kind of progressing, but also kind of a way going back like as well, that hopefully that this ongoing conversation continues because really, it, really it, it needs to be, you need to have black stories on Vogue. You need to have black stories on the cut. You need to have black stories in places that there is not, the target audience is not black. I don't care. If we're gonna tell the stories of white people and the 365 ways of being white, we should talk about 365 ways of being black, like in everybody else. Um, like Shonda said earlier, like inclusivity and equity is key. And a lot of people are starting to hit this diversity factor, but diversity isn't enough. You got to really start taking it a step further and really emb embodying that into the framework of your content and your pitches and your stories. So I do think that as you go up the totem pole and up the journalistic pole, that is where the fight comes. You know, I'm no longer fighting for a story to be approved. I'm fighting for it to become a just everyday occurrence for the other people on my team, for the people who don't look like me to feel empowered as well to cover the story. Mm -hmm. um, and and so the challenges change, but I I think that we're you know we are moving forward in the right direction. Okay, all right. Um, next question. So Ari asks, I'm curious since I'm very new to freelance to the freelance writing industry and fashion, how do you get your foot? How did you get your footing? I'm sorry. Is it all networking and reaching out? Um, I'll start. I'm not a native New Yorker. And uh, when I graduated from school, I really wanted to get into magazine publication work. Um, this is when print was still like that girl, all right? And so I, I started the Blonde Misfit actually as a digital portfolio. So, cause I, I thought, well, if I reach out to editors, I can show them that I can write, I can research, I can take topics and I can really put my own spin, my own flavor on it. And that's really how the Blonde Misfit started. And it just kind of grew to the point where even after I got on or I got into the doors, I continue to keep it up because we had this community of people who were like me, like different misfits and who felt that they weren't seen in the fashion and beauty industry, but we deserve, our stories deserve to be told as well. Um, I would say that starting that digital portfolio is really kind of how I got my footing because 
I was able to show those clips to different editors and writers. And it's one of those things where, you know, don't detest small beginnings use what you have and use what you can to get what you can while you have that and then upgrade as you go along um and then once i actually moved to new york i actually utilized those clips a lot when i would go to the networking events and i would say oh i have this website this blog x y and z and then people would check it out and they're like oh my gosh like we need someone who can write about these topics and so Really, it was about me sort of starting my own platform and, and just kind of putting myself out there and then utilizing network and reaching out later. And even to this day, I still do it. I follow people on LinkedIn. I stalk people. I hop and send them LinkedIn premium mails. Like net, the networking doesn't stop. And especially if you're someone who's a little bit more on the shy side or like networking in like an actual event space is kind of daunting you can definitely utilize social media to kind of put yourself on um, and then definitely sharing your clips because if someone can go to your Instagram and they see like all these great bylines and the different things that you've written, even if it's not for a major publication, it still shows them that you have the range. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes that's all it takes, honestly. Yep. yep. I think that that's a great point, like highlighting and kind of, you know, putting together your own work to kind of show that you are dedicated to it definitely changes everything. I remember when I first started, we had put together this freelance team of a photographer and a videographer, and we went to anyone's fashion week that would have us. And we talked to them, we interviewed them. And I saw I slid in with Walk. And from there, I started looking at the clients that or designers that had nice um, items. And I feel like there was a story there. There was something that they could kind of either um, showcase to kind of elevate their brand. And that's how I began to get my first clients. It was very like, it was laborious, but at the end of the day, like it really helped me to put my name out there. And I definitely miss events because I'm much more a face-to-face -face person when it comes to talking and selling myself, but definitely kind of, you know, creating your own portfolio does a world of difference when it comes to you promoting yourself. Yeah. And also what you said is important about, it's like manifesting, right? Mm -hmm. Like before you were writing for the bigger outlets, you were writing for someone smaller, you know, mm -hmm. before I was making a thousand plus on an article, I was making $25 on an article, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, you start somewhere, but I promise you this, the way I write for that thousand dollar article is the way I wrote for that $25 article. And I groomed myself and I, mm -hmm. and I used that muscle and I really honed in on it. And that's honestly what it is. You just keep putting your work out there. You keep just showing up. I remember some years ago, someone told me, they're like, you don't have to ever cut down the knees of your competition because 90% of people will just fall off by the wayside because people are not consistent. Yep. And if you just stay consistent and you just show up every day and you put your best foot forward in whatever it is that you do, at some point, something has to break. The universe cannot allow you as you continue to mentally elevate and push yourself up for you to stay the same. Like that's just like not the way energy works, right? Like you have to shift form. And so just continue to show up and freelance, even if you can't, Ari, I think, it's, yeah, Ari, you asked the question, pitch your favorite outlets, even if you can't get no more than $50 for the byline girl, like at least you have those names. Even, you know, a lot of us probably wrote for free when we first started out. And, you know, even up until like a couple of years ago, I was still writing free for some of these big brands just to say that I could have that name on my resume, like pay, like that's the paying your dues part of it all. But I promise you just, if you show up and if you really put in the work, like it, it happens for you. And I know like it's daunting because everyone's like, I don't know if it really will. It will. It will. You just got to stay the course and stay faithful and stay focused. Yep. Yep. Definitely. I think that just going back to what you said, like doing stuff for free, I know people are kind of on edge about doing things and learning more, but if there's ever a space where I feel like I want to hone in on something, I'm more inclined to take on some work for free or for less than I normally would have just to develop my skills and add it to my portfolio in a way that I can take back. So I'm never, um, ever like deterred from wanting to learn more or for wanting to kind of expand upon whatever it is that I do not know. So I'm always a student, no matter how many clients I get or how much I grow, the willingness to learn to be the best of what I can be will never go away for me. So Kath, I, I go ahead. Oh, I just want to jump in real quick and I don't know if, baby. 
I don't think my boyfriend's listening to me, but he always says to me that what you do in life, it, sh it shouldn't just be your passion. It should be your obsession. Mm -hmm. Like it should be something that you're obsessed about. You should be waking up, thinking about it, going to bed, thinking about it. And, and sometimes for me, I like, I'm, I'm new. I'm still new. Like I've, I've only been full-time freelance writing for about a year now, but the, some of the free projects that I do are some of the most memorable moments of my career in my entire life because I loved what I do, what I did so much. And I was so passionate about that story, about that talent, about that article, that money will come and go at, at the end of the day, I'm gonna secure the bag either way. I'm, I'm gonna get to the money no matter what I do. But if I really love what I'm doing, and if I really believe in this talent in this story, you don't have to pay me. Like if you, if you got, if you got the budget, great. I mean, I'll take the bread, but if I really want to do it just because I want to do it, mm -hmm. then I'm going to do it. There are some A-list celebrities that I've talked to for free mm -hmm. because I wanted to, because there's something that's so, there's something that's so untangible about having that moment and having that experience that's worth so much more than a check can give you. Don't get me wrong, checks are nice, but it's those moments in those relationship building or when the talent or the brand posts your story without you even asking because the interview was just that good or it was just that memorable or they follow you or they send you something. It's that relationship building that will ultimately really help your career. Like you're, you're not always gonna get paid for what you do. And it, it really sucks to say that. You're not always gonna get paid, but if you love what you do so much, and if you're obsessed with it, and if it's your passion, and if you really believe in what you're writing about, and if you really believe in the platform and the talent, the money will come. Like it was just said, like I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a better writer. I'm just on a bigger platform. Mm -hmm. I, I just write to more high clientele. People that I was writing for for free this time last year, I'm still given that same energy throughout my career. It doesn't matter that I was featured in a hype day or a high snobiety or an MTV or whatever, what have you. I always kept that same energy because I was always obsessed with my art. I was always obsessed with growing and people just so happened to match that energy. My energy never changed. I was always the same writer pushing out this content. I always gave a damn about what I wrote about, but now the world is seeing it. So to, to you, Ari, like just really believe in yourself. No one's gonna believe in you if you don't believe in you. Like it was said before, pitch to the bigger outlets because there are some outlets that I have bylines on that I would never think would pay attention to me and that would never accept my pitches. But now I'm their go-to girl. Mm -hmm. Always bet on yourself mm -hmm. or else no one's gonna bet on you. I just want to say thank you so much. I've been listening the whole time. I really appreciate it so much because Sorry if I'm infringing on anyone's time. I am very new. Um, I have a social work degree and the pandemic just made me realize that I do want to get into more like marketing and writing, but also funny enough, like fashion, because I've been doing fashion since high school <laughs> and I'm 23. But thank you so much because I'm just so nervous, especially like since the pandemic hit and I graduated during the pandemic and just finding employment. I'm just like, well, I've got nothing to lose at this point if I want to go for what I want to go for, like for real. So I'm just getting my footing, but honestly, all this advice is extremely helpful. Also, I'm really sad that um, the other speaker wasn't here to talk about the fashion portion, but I hope uh, I'll be following everyone and keeping up to date with everyone and what to do. So thank you. Sorry, you know, like this is the perfect time now to just shoot your shot. Like, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> <laughs> it is the perfect time to have like you know I, I think to myself like pandemic really put me in big dick energy like 24 7 just feeling myself I can do whatever I want to do I can set whatever I set my mind to because really if you think about it take everything um that the pandemic has taken away but think about on the flip side how you can utilize that right because like for instance in our industry a lot of us were taught you can't do these types of things unless you move to a new york unless you move to an la or into an atlanta now everybody's doing remote jobs you can interview anyone as long as you got a camera like you can do these things so like shoot your shot and think about like 
how you can utilize these things to your advantage. Start the website, start the portfolio, reach out to people for informationals, reach out to the people on this call, you know, or people who in the industry who you who really admire and like ask them questions because people have the time, I would say now, like, of course, being mindful and respectful of like mental health and boundaries and stuff, but people have the time now. So it's like, don't be nervous. You know, you, this is, this is, this is, it's go time, baby. Like it's <laughs> right. Time to really right. Pick yourself and throw you. yourself out there. Like, look, jump in the net will appear. It will. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Okay. I think we had one more question. Kathleen asked, I'm curious how many of your stories come from pitches? I guess for me, I think it's like maybe half and half. Some of them come from good pitches and then some of them come from just doing research. Uh, what news stories I like need to cover because everyone is talking about it. And then pitches, uh, I try to look for, for pitches for me, I like the ones that stand out. And also if your pitch should be a story that no one has covered yet or very few have covered and it's good and it's a fit for me, I'm more than likely to gravitate towards that. I like those pitches. Mm -hmm. My editors like those pitches because uh, for us being a black owned outlet, it's hard enough to compete with other big name outlets for those stories because all brands go to the tech crunches or they, they, they go to the, the business insiders first and then they come to us. So for us, we, we like that exclusive factor and we like being able to tell those stories first because we know at the end of the day, we're going to get the story right. If you're a black owned business or a black founder, we know you're going to get your story right and tell it the way it needs to be told versus other outlets that will probably just tell the, the surface level stuff. So uh, yeah, for me, uh, it's doing research through news and then also just looking out for your pitches. Okay, so half and half. Perfect. What about you guys? Is it kind of half and half as well? You're just doing your research and then the other is about perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, did anyone else have any questions before we get to wrapping up? Nope. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you ladies for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, you guys could have been doing anything, been anywhere. Um, I just really appreciate your time and you guys taking the time to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. For us. Yeah, these, these ladies are great. I feel like I've watched them from afar. I admire all of their work. I've seen so much and everyone on this panel is like a really hard worker. So I am so in awe of you guys and I'm so grateful for you giving me some of your time today. Um, and as always, thank you. So um, unless anyone else has anything else they want to add, I will kind of wrap this up. Um, just to let you know that this will be for playback on our Facebook um, group page. So if you guys don't follow us, please follow us there so you can have access to it. To it. Um, we're gonna send a thank you email as well and it'll have that link inside of it too. So um, again, just thank you guys for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Um, yeah, and if you do wanna connect with us um, as well for the agency, my Instagram is IAMNKC. Perfect. Should we give our socials as well? Yes, ma'am, you guys can. It's their socials are on the flyer, but if you want to say them now or drop them in the chat, that would be so helpful. All right, but I'm gonna put it in the chat as I talk. So my Instagram and my Twitter literally have the same handle. It's at, so I did that as a DM, sorry to everyone. <laughs> Let's do this one more time. It's at signed Shonda, S-I-G-N-E-D, Shonda, like Shonda Rhimes, S-H-O-N-D-A. And there you can find all my work, some ratchet shit from time to time. It really depends on my mood. Um, but if any of you have any questions about, um, about pitching or if you have a sample pitch that you want to send over to me to review, I, I don't mind doing that. Like, hey, this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't. Please feel free to hit me up. I, I'm always by my phone. So don't hesitate to follow like ETC, ETC. Perfect. Thank you. My Instagram and Twitter are both the blonde, at The Blonde Misfit. Uh, my podcast is The Blonde Misfit Podcast. Website is theblondmisfit.com. Also, you guys, I've dropped in the chat my email. It's just jamay at theblondmisfit.com. 
Um, also, if you want to check out my other bylines, you can go to jamaejackson.com. I know it's a mouthful, but really it's just two things, the blonde misfit and Jamae. Just remember those. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. And then I'm going to drop mine in the chat. Um, I'm the same on Twitter and Instagram at I am in Jira. Uh, I'm very friendly. My DMs are open if you guys have any questions. Uh, if you just want to reach out, if you have a brand or a business or something that you think I should cover, please reach out. I'm always accepting pitches. So uh, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Hi. Oh, I want to also add, I am, we are also looking for pitches for Women's History Month. So if you yeah, are a so. business, Black owned business that can be applicable to Women's History Month or anything like that, please feel free to also send pitches and ideas along. Same okay. here. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'm going to leave that up for a second and let people get all that information. But again, thank you guys for joining us. I feel like this was wonderful. It exceeded my expectations. We had a great membership too on our Facebook Live. So I'm happy about that as well. You guys are, I can't say it enough, amazing. Um, and I feel like you just dropped and shared so much information that it's really going to be helpful. And I'm hoping that people will get more comfortable with, again, crafting those relationships and then feeling free to pitch and kind of get the conversation started around their brand um, without feeling the need to go the publicist route. So I know that's weird to say, being that I own a PR agency, but <laughs> <laughs> you don't necessarily need me. We do so much other stuff. So if you're really trying someone that's just getting your, your start and you're getting your feet wet, I'm not the first call. I feel like we're going to be doing a whole lot of stuff. Um, from brand development to marketing to all of these other things. So cool. Okay. Okay. I'm just gonna I always sit on these calls until people filter out. So you don't feel the need to like just sit with me. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm really like particular about that. So you guys can definitely jump off whenever you want to. Okay.